but we had to, to get the eggs was a big deal. You know, it took a couple of weeks, and finally the guy watched how I could eat, and he chickened out. I saw the most important thing about being well dressed is first of all being well groomed. I think if you look good naked, you look good dressed. Judge James Ernest has heard the whole gamut of excuses. Those with poor health, he automatically dismisses, but he finds little sympathy with others. Good evening, I'm Joe Abril. The 1960s are remembered as troubled, rebellious, but changing times. Even the art and literature, of course, then reflected the mood of this country. And one of the most memorable examples was the movie Cool Hand Luke. The author of that book and screenplay lives in South Florida, and Nancy Solomon reports. His movie opens the way his adult life began. A young man is in trouble. Dom Pierce was in the safe-cracking business, but like Paul Newman, soon found himself in the hands of the law. What are you doing there, fella? I'm just captive of uh, a meeting. You better come along with us. It's been about 30 years since Pierce paid for his crime by spending time on a Florida chain gang. When he got out, he joined the Merchant Marines, then settled down to write of prison life and of a legendary convict, Cool Hand Luke. It took years of slaving over his typewriter, but Pierce finally had the book published. Then in 1967, he co-authored the screenplay. That year in Hollywood brings back bittersweet memories. Now, they didn't like me very much um, for lots of reasons. First of all, writers have a very low position in Hollywood. And belatedly, I realized that in their concept, I was not really a writer. I was an ex-convict who happened to write a book. And I couldn't get anybody to, uh, to even understand what I meant when I say, hey, let's see some real work. They didn't even understand the concept. I mean, these are all pussycats sitting around in bars getting fat, you know. Aside from being the technical advisor, Pierce had a small part in the movie playing one of the convicts but he claims he was pushed in the back. And every once in a while, I would try to invent a little shtick for myself to, to get into the film. For instance, a jumping rope while wearing leg irons, which is quite a trick. And, uh, but uh, these Hollywood guys, the next thing I know, while I was turning the rope, skipping rope, I forget his name, and it's just as well. He's a very, very short. He's not a dwarf or anything, but he's a very short guy, covered with hair and tremendous muscles. He's a former weightlifter. He jumps into the rope and starts spinning around. I said, this is really what they mean when they say upstage. Here, I'm the clown turning the rope. <laughs> he's the one that did the trick. Pierce desperately wanted to be part of the chain gang recreation, especially since he embellished upon the legendary Cool Hand Luke with his own experiences. Working in his yard, he still remembers some of them. Nobody could outwork me. I was fat. I wasn't the biggest guy, but I was the fastest, and I was the one who could put, I could do it for 12 hours straight. Just, just go. It was a kind of a strange kind of a rebellion. It was a thing that, now that you're down in the lowest possible situation, the only way you could fight back, in an abstract way, fighting back, because by doing more work, you're not fighting back at all. You're doing what they want you to do. But by doing more than you have to do, it's a kind of an abstract rebellion or a, a daring, it's a, it's a defiance. Hey, buddy, slow down. That's a long road. Yeah, well, the man won't see, let's just give it to him. Ram it in, drink it off. Yeah! You were not even allowed to look at the, the free world traffic going by. That was considered eyeballing, which was a serious crime. You were not allowed to look at a free person. Of course, it was done surreptitiously. There's a whole art of eyeballing. <laughs> when the mine here, boss. You see that? You see that? I got eyes, don't I? I'm not going to see something. I was the like big that. eater. I was the big worker. Kind of per perverse pride of that. That's, that's kind of... I can eat 50 eggs. Nobody can eat 50 eggs. You just said he could eat anything. You ever eat 50 eggs? Nobody ever eats 50 eggs. Hey, Babaluga, we got a bet here. My boy says he can eat 50 eggs, he can eat 50 eggs. Yeah, but how long? The hour. The egg-eating thing, it never actually took place, but the bet did. It was true up to the point of the actual contest. Ready?
but we had to, to get the eggs was a big deal, you know, and it took a couple of weeks and finally the guy watched how I could eat and he chickened out. I'll never know whether I would have won that or not. Swallow the last. No, he didn't swallow the last. Thanks, so, huh? What does take a look here? Open that mouth. Ah! I was one of the few guys who did not have a nickname. They called me Don. There's a very subtle kind of a respect there. Yeah. Right there. One, two, yeah. three, four, five. Yeah. Oh, right <laughs> up, right? Oh! Another. Hey, another. 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 With nothing. Yeah, well, sometimes nothing can be a real cool hand. <laughs> oh, oh. oh, sit in here next to my boy. Oh, yeah, Duke. But unlike the folk hero played by Newman, Pierce is more extroverted, more outspoken, which could explain the final clash between himself and the Hollywood gang. When everyone gathered in the studio, a crew member sarcastically started raiding the actors. This was through a bullhorn, I want you to know. A bullhorn in a movie studio. So finally said, Don Pierce, you have no rating. I think it had to be the absolute profundity of it, because he was absolutely right. I mean, if you want to look at this analytically. Anyway, I turned around and bowled him in the mouth. And of course, everybody went hysterical. It was like the killer. I couldn't believe the reaction that they had. I mean, uh, to them, it was the killer come loose. I'm sure they're convinced that I had killed people and armed robberies, and, but I just wasn't telling about it, you see. Back home in Broward County, he tried his luck at writing again. But the two novels he produced, one about South Florida's elderly and the other a novel based on his years at sea, didn't sell too well. Neither one was reviewed in the Miami Herald. And freelancing for magazines just wasn't paying the bills. So for the past four years, Pierce has been a private investigator. Do you know this gal? It's often mundane work, but a necessity, since most of the 80000 he made from the movie is gone. The movie in retrospect, Pierce claims Hollywood made it into something it wasn't. People see it as a, as a social comment because it came out, the, the movie was released in, I think, 1967. So by pure coincidence, it, it had overtones which were not actually intended. Sorry, Luke. I'm just doing my job. You gotta appreciate that. Nah. Calling your job don't make it right, boss. And in fact, the the true subject had nothing to do with prison or or criminality. As a matter of fact, it was uh, the condition of the human race. Pierce is now 50 and somewhat worried about his future. He wants to write, but is discouraged. He says he's the victim of bad luck and bad timing. Sounds like someone else we know. On my knees, asking. Yeah, that's what I thought. I guess I'm pretty tough to deal with, huh? Well, now, you know we're interested in bringing to you the people who uh, make this world of today change and, and uh, have uh, texture, I guess you would say. And one of those is the gentleman with me, Oscar de la Renta, who is uh, surely one of the world's foremost fashion designers and uh, a uh, almost citizen of the world, but uh, a Dominican. Are you, are you an American citizen now? or I am an American citizen, yes, but actually uh, I'm a Dominican citizen too because uh, 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 you can have dual citizenship and, uh, uh, you know, so, yeah. I'm, I, you know, the American at heart was I carried uh, yes. an American passport. <laughs> we were just uh, celebrating together the great uh, peaceful transition of power in your country, uh, which we both recognize a great stride forward for Latin America. You know, I felt, you know, very bad, obviously, because of the, of the newspaper strike in New York. Uh, I haven't really been reading many newspapers lately, but I was very, very upset that it was really so badly covered by, by the press yes. because 
I felt that this, you know, that is so important that in, in a Latin American country, uh, we have a peaceful transfer uh, oh, of, yeah. uh, I mean, of power, and that not a single, you know, bullet was, you know, shot. Yes. And uh, uh, and I think that Mr. Guzman is going to be good. And if he's not good, not good we have the alternative. And in four years, we can elect somebody else. Absolutely. <laughs> do you think that you, as as a leading designer, lead women into new new designs, or do you follow the tastes? Well, I think that my role as a designer is really uh, to suggest, and, and I think that it's really ultimately the woman herself who tells me what I should be doing. Now, let me ask you about fabrics. Uh, I suddenly see cotton back, and I remember just a few years ago, cotton was out. I think that in, this is something that has been happening, uh, and I feel very strongly in the last sort of six, seven years, we are developing a very, very strong, especially among the young, we are developing a very strong sense for quality. You know, uh, like, for example, uh, on the 60s, you know, you will go and buy some, some fake jewelry. A girl will go yeah. and buy some fake jewelry, and she will buy a very a chunky thing that she pays $30, $40 for. I think that at the today, you would like to, the girl would like to buy a very small gold chain that she puts a little bit more money into, but it's real, it's gold, it has, it has a lasting value. Right. Uh, I think that we are dis you know, discovering that the real luxury about life is to appreciate the things we live with and the things that we like. And that's, uh, that's part of wearing a cotton shirt. You have to work more to keep that cotton shirt in good shape and looking good, but at the same time, you know the feeling of it is, right. is you know is yeah, oh, I love. is you know is different right. and the very strange thing is that uh, men you know in a very strange way have much more a sense of sort of comfort and you know you know you know, you know luxury that the women have and we always tend to think you know the country but you will find many many more men who will tell you I'll never wear a you know a polyester shirt mm -hmm. while a woman and we want to think of a woman's skin up something absolutely extraordinary yeah. she will put a polyester dress with the greatest of ease you know yeah well, now men are tell me the difference between men and women as far as clothes and design go in your estimation well I think that the, uh, the women are uh, in the peacock of the of the how you can say it? No, I mean like most animals, the male carries all the, uh, all the colors. I think yeah. that in the human race, it's the the, the girl is really the one yeah. who who for whom we get all the variety. Because I really think that the men's clothes, we, you know, we haven't changed that much in many many years, and we dress very similar, and the same way, very in a very conservative way. Now, why is that? Well, here we are still wearing jackets, pretty much like they were 150 years ago or 100 years ago. We're never going to get away from this. Well, uh, I really don't think so. I think that it's going to. Um, we, I mean, it, it it has been tried very strongly in the last 10, 15 years. I think that we dress different, you know, uh, a slightly different when it comes to to you know you know to leisure wear and things like that. But I think that. Uh, in a way, we sort of need that suit for an assurance. I don't know. Uh, 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 now, you are in, in the, uh, at the pinnacle of the fashion world, beautiful women, beautiful clothes. A lot of people watching you now would like to get a couple of, or at least one free tip on what really makes somebody look really smashing and attractive. Any, any uh, Oscar de la Renta tr tips? You know, my big tips really for men or women, and, and, and especially obvious, obviously for girls, I think the most important thing about being well-dressed is first of all being well-groomed. I think that if you look good naked, you look good dressed. You know, I think that if you take care of, of your body first, then, you know, you are going to look good with whatever, yeah. you know, uh, that you have on. And, uh, uh, and and being very 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 well groomed for me is very important, you know. And uh, I say if you have a two thousand dollar dress and the girl has dirty nails, she doesn't have a good dress on, you know. Indeed. And uh, so that you know the the at the physical part that we are so much involved with in this country, especially you know you know today where everybody's jogging and doing all those things, that's very important. I think that that is that is very very important. Then once you put that dress on. 
is to be yourself and to put the, the you know, the clothes that suits your personality, that fit into your lifestyle, and always, when when in doubt, don't. I mean, always be underdressed and never o overdress. Yeah, you know? very good. Yes, absolutely. Now that's a good way to, to remember. When in doubt, don't. I think <laughs> that's pretty good. Oscar De La Renta, thank you very much for being with us. We've thank enjoyed you. it very much. We'll look forward to your clothes in the future, male and female. We'll be right back. Now, Perry Mason may not be the attorney standing before you, but if you're selected as a prospective juror, you may find the lawyers and the cases more exciting than you thought. Here's Nancy Solomon to tell us more. Lower right-hand corner, sign your name and give us your phone number. It's 8.30 Monday morning, and the 15th floor of the Dade County Courthouse is jammed with over 250 people. All are registered voters and have been randomly chosen by a computer for jury duty. Only a few miles away, another 150 prospective jurors are filing into the Metro Justice Building. They'll serve on criminal trials, and the people here will sit as jurors on civil cases. Jury pool supervisor Janice Karp begins broadcasting a list of instructions to an apprehensive group. If there's anyone in here who wishes to request excusal from the judge, would you please stand? Go behind the closed doors on the side of the room and wait back there, please. Those who don't want to serve queue up in line. Hopeful the presiding judge will excuse them. All rise, please. Court will now come to order. The Honorable James H. Ernest presiding. Be seated. Sitting on the jury panel is one of the most important things next to voting and being a good citizen otherwise that you can do. Judge James Ernest has heard the whole gamut of excuses. Those with poor health he automatically dismisses, but he finds little sympathy with others. And I know. My problem is, uh, I don't know, is, is it good my English, you know? That's the reason only. Well, but know. I would like it to serve the, I want my country. But well, why I don't, don't you know. try it here? There, there will be an opportunity. I would like it to try. All right, let, let's try it and see. The attorneys will have They're all uh, very sincere sounding, and uh, I take them as being sincere and honest. Let's try it here. They don't have to be to school until 8 o'clock, and they don't get up until about 7. And I have to leave Homestead at 6.30 to get here by the right. time I get here. You're excused, ma'am. Okay, thank, thank you. you. You're free to go. They are afraid of that which they don't know something about. Well, what happens if you're sick? I don't know. Don't you have a backup man? No, sir. I'm the backup man. Well, I know, but don't you have uh, somebody who immediately... Third no, sir. Yeah. Well, technically, it's not a legal excuse. Those not excused join the other jurors being randomly assigned to a civil court judge. If I call your name and number, you will be assigned to Judge Ernest. 431, Gerard Hardina. 434, Francis Miller. 435, Sidney Sachs. Mr. Judge, you to step over to your right, please. Sitting on a jury for the first time can be a little intimidating. Some say it's like being on display before a critical audience. The plaintiff's attorney briefly explains to the prospective jurors that he wants a substantial amount of money for his client who was involved in an automobile accident. Then he starts his questioning. Eventually, nine out of the 15 will be eliminated or not used to make a jury of six. Both plaintiff and defense attorney try to find out the educational and working backgrounds of the jurors. This will help them determine how he or she might vote when it comes to paying out money for damages. Since your father was a lawyer, and I'm sure you've heard legal talk around your house and so on and so forth, do you feel that you could sit here today and decide this case fairly, despite the fact that you've had some exposure to the law? Absolutely. I think it would help me more than hurt right. me make a fair judgment. Ms. Miller? When you had your accident some years ago, did that involve any trucks? Yes, it was a truck that hit us. It was a small, rather small truck. It was Glazier's truck, and his brakes went out. Both attorneys tell the clerk who they want off the jury. The following jurors are excused, and as you are excused, if you would, would report back immediately to the 15th floor for further instructions. Juror number one, Emily Ann Smith, you're excused. 
I more or less expected it because, um, well, my dad's a lawyer and um, they tend to stay away from uh, people who might know what's going on and they think that um, you have some type of inside information. As it sometimes happens, only one male is selected for this official jury. He, along with the others, is assigned a number, one through six. According to law, the evidence, so help you God. Be seated for a moment. Mr. McKee, please. The start of a two day trial begins with the attorney's opening statements. What struck the vehicle, a substantial impact, bounced off, jackknife. During the course of the trial, jurors will hear from a number of witnesses testifying on behalf of both parties. And there will be evidence to consider, such as photographs of the accident. Although the jurors are not verbal during the trial, they still react, as seen in their expressions and movements. Those who haven't been selected to sit on a jury wait for their names to be called again for another trial. Even though dismissed by attorneys and having to start the whole process again, most weren't discouraged. Um, let's bring you my picture. Was it everything that you imagined, or is it different? It's so different. It's much better than how I imagined. How did you imagine it? Well, I thought it was like a court, but it's more friendly. Friendly could mean being made to feel comfortable. Reading material is available, and so is television. Ironically, some commercials remind jurors of where they are. Enjoy, indulge, and feel... Not guilty. Light and luscious from Sara Lee. Back in the courtroom on the second day of the trial, testimony winds down while closing arguments begin. I'm going to ask you for $10,000 for future pain and suffering, $1,100 for Cedars of Lebanon, $490 for Dr. Struhl. It's easy to write anything on the chalkboard. Just put it down. There's our two arbitrary figures there, at least one for pain and suffering in the past and one in the future. Just, they're just numbers. Just, I could write down a number and put all the zeros after it I want. But that doesn't give it any meaning. The jurors are sequestered for the next hour and a half. No cameras, no lawyers, no witnesses to interrupt their deliberation as they decide the financial fate of the plaintiff. The verdict. Will the jury find for the plaintiff look to James Green and assess his damages in sum of $12,994 and it looks like, uh, is that 99 cents? Yes. 99 cents. Jurors, I have just read a verdict. The verdict I have read is your verdict. Please answer in these words. That is my verdict as I call out your name. Jared, Gerard Hardina. That is my verdict. Francis Miller. That is my verdict. Features Barr. That is my Thank you. They've given less money than the plaintiff's attorney requested, but their expressions indicate that either they're content with their verdict or glad the trial's over. The jurors reflect on their experience as they wait to find out what other trials they'll sit on during the week. I have uh, been down here before on other juries, and this one um, was an experience for me, basically, because I guess I was the only man on a five-woman or a six-man jury panel. And uh, it was a little different. They have different opinions, but we came out with a good verdict, I believe. I protested, and my bosses told me to come down here. But since I've been here, I was very proud to serve on the jury, and it was a, quite an experience. Well, it was the first time I've ever been in the courtroom, and I say I was really proud to serve as a juror the first time I had to be in a courtroom, but I think, above all, it was the most American thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> if you receive a summons for jury duty and have a legal excuse, but you still want to serve at another time, contact the jury pool so your name can be placed on what's called a deferred list. Don't miss the chance to serve. You might enjoy it. Montage will be preempted next week so that Channel 4 can bring you live the candidates for the Thursday, October 5th runoff election. And that's our montage for tonight. I'm Joe Abril. Good evening.